Welcome to the Portland Culinary Podcast on Portland Culinary Radio. I'm Stephen Shalma, your host. I'm just delighted. Uh, joining me this morning is a Portland Culinary VIP. Uh, she probably may not be as fond of that description, but I think she's very, very important in the Portland Culinary world. Uh, Liz Crane. Good morning, Liz. Hi, Stephen. So excited to have you here. You know, I own your books. Um, I love your books. So how I see you is you're a prolific food author. You're a food writer. You've written cookbooks. So you've put together four books, you've edited some books, um, you've done Food Lover's Guide to Portland, you've done two cookbooks, you've done a cannabis book. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's pretty fun, right? <laughs> cannabis and food, they kind of go well together. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, and so uh, we recorded a Portland uh, Culinary Podcast episode. We're telling your story, how you got to do all this fun stuff. Uh, but this episode, we're talking about the Portland Fermentation Festival, which I am super excited about. Uh, I bought my tickets. I'm going to be there. Looking forward to going. I've I know three years has been on my radar, and it hasn't fit in my schedule, and finally this year I'm going. I've Yay. got my tickets bought. So for those that don't know, what is the Portland Fermentation Festival? So this is our eighth annual this year, Thursday, October 26th at EcoTrust. And basically, uh, we like to have this be a celebration of fermented food and drink where you can sample all sorts of things like Ethiopian injera or hard cider or natto or miso and learn from the makers of those foods and drinks how to make them. So you might just want to come and sample all of these delicious things, but you can also talk to the amateur makers or the professional makers um, and get recipes and kind of troubleshooting and, and info on that. So this is the eighth year, and yep. you do the event every year in the fall, so kind of sometimes September, sometimes October. Yep. So if people are listening to this podcast, you know, and it's March of 2019, they can just go online and look and find out when this year's event is. Exactly. Uh, and every year it's... it's Every year it's a little bit different, a little bit different vendors. Sometimes there's panels, sometimes there's not. But big picture, yeah. I get to sample fermented food and fermented beverage yep. and talk to the people who are doing it. Exactly. We want to inspire people. Um, one thing that's important to us is we ha when, once you get into the festival, you're not spending any money. So you're going to demos on how to make fermented nut cheeses or how to make natto, and you are learning how how these people came into this world of fermentation and trying 50 plus fermented foods. So we usually have 20 plus vendors in the main tasting room. There are two tastings. So the doors open at six and that's the first tasting begins. Um, so you walk around the room and you get to try um, things like fermented tofu or sour pickles or kimchi and um, just enjoy these flavorful foods and talk to the people who made them. And then if you get overwhelmed by it, because it can be kind of crowded, and the nickname for the festival is Stink Fest. Yes, I've seen you put that <laughs> on social media. It's cracked up and made me laugh. It gets, there are a lot of crocs in the room, and a lot of things getting opened up that are kind of bubbly and funky and uh, have, have ripe smells. You can go up to the rooftop, and up on the rooftop, uh, my boyfriend, Jimbo, ha always puts together a festival playlist. You can listen to nice music. There's a big fireplace. Um, lights are strung. And you can get a pint of Reverend Nat's hard cider. You can get a bite to eat from Cinder Barbecue. And in the eight years that we've had the festival, it's never been rainy. And that's really odd because it's always in the fall. But maybe this will be the year that we have rain. Regardless, it'll be nice up there and get a little breath of fresh air. And uh, so tickets are generally 10 bucks each year. Exactly. Kids 12 and under are free. Yep. So I get to go, um, how many different vendors roughly every year? Usually we have 20 plus. That's that's usually what I'm, I'm saying. It might be closer to 30 this year. Um, but, but every year 20 to 30. Yeah, yeah. And then if I show up about how many different fermented foods, not beverages, roughly might I get to sample? I think that a good number is to say 50 plus. Yeah, because some of just the exhibitors. Foods? Yeah, just foods? Just foods. Plus. Foods and drinks. Okay, Sorry. how about how many just foods? How many uh, roughly foods, different types of fermented foods? I'd say 30 plus. 30, because I, yeah. I know about fermented um, beverages, right. even the non-alcoholic ones, which, yeah. which some of those are? Uh, kefir, kombucha is probably the most popular one right now, um, kvass. So I'm aware of those, but yeah. if you put, you know, if you said, hey, Stephen, I need you to name 50 or 30 different fermented foods. I'm not sure I could. Right. Uh, kind of like the fruit beer festival they use. I love, it's one of my favorite festivals uh, for beer. You know, they do 50 different fruits and I go 50 different fruits and then I make a list. Oh, I get, I did know them. I didn't yeah. realize I did, but I probably get to sample 30 roughly depending on the year, 30 different fermented foods. Yeah. 
it's pretty wild. A lot of them are vegetable ferments, so think pickly type of things, you know, kimchi, sauerkraut, sour pickles. But also, you know, we have natto, which is a Japanese fermented soybean. It's a really fast ferment. It sort of looks a little bit like Rice Krispie treats. Sort of if you pull apart the soybeans, there's this kind of viscous stringy thing that happens to it. Um, all, uh, all of the breads, like sourdough breads that are leaven breads, um, those are fermented. Like I said, injera, we have um, Spice of Africa is going to be sampling um, their injera at the festival. So that's sort of this bubbly, fermenty, sour, tough grain um, kind of pancake of a bread. If you go to get Ethiopian food, you'll get all of the different kind of piles of curries and beans and greens on top of it. And no silverware. Um, you kind of just use you that. You just use your hands and yep. just sort of wrap up the food in it. That's now, really I've, yummy. I've had injera. I've had Ethiopian injera. I've had yeah. Oromo injera. I didn't realize it was fermented. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, I, I think that the sourness sometimes can be overplayed by all of the full flavor curries on top, so you wouldn't notice. But if you eat it just on its own and you just kind of look at the bubbles that are the sort of craters that are in it, you, you can tell, oh, yeah, that's, that's a product of fermentation. But, yeah, when you're just wrapping it around all the curries and beans, it's sort of a vehicle, right? It's okay, like a so tortilla chip is a vehicle for salsa. So here's the part that sets me. Ten yeah. bucks, I get in, I yeah. get my ticket. Kids 1200 free, but then if I'm like, okay, I need a break, I can go upstairs and yep. I can buy a cider. Yep. River Nats are cider. I love me some River Nats. Yeah. And then um, usually you have a different food vendor each year that I can get, you know, just a fun meal. Exactly. We, yeah, we added that, I think maybe three or four years ago, we noticed that people, you know, getting all of the samples is delicious and super fun, but th- at a certain point, your stomach might feel like mm, it needs a little padding, or you just want a breath of fresh air, too. It's just nice. It's a beautiful rooftop. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm glad that you're coming. Okay. Um, I know we did this a little bit, but uh, give, me, give me some more examples of fermented food. Okay. Um, so we talked about the breads. We talked about miso, natto, all of the pickly things. Um chocolate is fermented, coffee is fermented. Like if you think about um, France, think so is, about... Is, yeah. all, is all coffee fermented or just some? I believe that all of it is fermented because when you pick the the green coffee, um, it's, it's sort of similar to all tea is fermented. There's a certain amount of curing that goes on, which is the beans are actually fermenting and developing flavor as they dry. And then it's roasted. And a lot of people don't know what about cheese. All cheese is fermented. Woo, yeah, yes. <laughs> delicious. I mean, not fresh cheeses, of course. So like paneer and ricotta and these kinds of real quick, just add a little acid and, and curd and, and then you're good. Um, those aren't. But yeah, if you're getting any of the rind cheeses or the ooey gooey cheeses, those are all fermented. Okay, and you brought me some miso as a gift. I did. Yeah, that's my two-year miso. I think the oldest miso that I have right now is seven years. Yeah, I started in 2010. So so like on the Portland Beer Podcast, I like to drink a beer at the end of the podcast. But okay. But this episode, oh, we'll eat some miso at the end and talk oh, about I that. Oh, I like the sound of that. Yeah. So what I want to know is, um, okay, so every year what's caught my eye, you know, honestly, is, oh, they've got Reverend Nat there. Yeah. Uh, and I've just, so you have Reverend Nat again this year. So tell me about some of the things that he's done. Well, one one fun thing I would like to say is that Nat came to the first fermentation festival that we had um, in eight, eight years ago in 2009, and he came and he brought he had on a, a like big white tank top and his hair was back in this it's almost like a do rag I don't know if it was but it kind of looked like that and he came to the table that I was at I was sampling hard cider from the Gravenstein apples that were in my backyard and uh, he tasted it and he said, Oh, this is good. And let me give you a bottle of my hard cider. And his hard cider was delicious. He was, um, he was working in tech and sort of a stay at home dad. And he was making cider in his basement and garage and um, really enjoying it. I tried it, liked it. We became friends. I helped him out once at his house on a cider press so anyway, there's a little background on that. And of course, now he has Reverend Nat Cidery, and they're moving to a 
space that's four times as large and you can get his cider in Japan. <laughs> um, but he every year uses the fermentation festival as a reason to kind of step outside his comfort zone and try a ferment that he's never tried before. So some things that he's made in the past, um, chicha, which is a South Central American chewed up corn, spit out ferment, um, which kind of grosses a lot of people out. But I tried it and it was pretty good. Um, he made that last year. Um, in years past, he's made Mongolian milk wine. He's made a lamb cider. So a cider that he kind of rubbed the outside with a mold inoculant and then steeped that in the cider. It had a little bit of a like A1 steak sauce flavor to it. It was weird. That was his funkiest cider that ever. That was a really funky one. And this year he's doing Oko Le Hao. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it's a Hawaiian um, root ferment that I've never had. I'd never heard of before. Um, but I guess it's very popular throughout the Hawaiian islands and it's from the TI, the tea plant. Um, so that'll be fun to try. He just, he likes to do something different and experiment and it's fun and playful for him. And, you know, we love it. It's just, there's, you always know that walking up to the Reverend Nat table, Nat's going to pour you something unusual that you've never tried before. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so cool question for me. I know why uh, I started the Portland Radler Festival. Right. Why the heck did you start the Portland Fermentation Festival eight years ago, you and your cohorts? Well, we, so I co-organized the festival with George Winborn, David Barber, and this past year we brought on Heidi Nestler. So we, George and David and I originally, years ago, um, had all gotten into fermentation through a man named Sandor Ellix Cat. And he's sort of the fermentation guru so in wait, North so America. So Sandor Ellix Katz. Exactly. K-A-T-Z? K-A-T-Z. Okay. And he's the author of Wild Fermentation, The Art of Fermentation, The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, a lot of books. Um, and so I had gone out to Tennessee to interview him for The Sun magazine um, and was so inspired by that interview. And then George and David had done fermentation workshops with Sandor. Sandor travels the world teaching and skill sharing um, uh, fermentation workshops. And so they had attended one of those, and we all were inspired. We wanted to have something long lasting, some sort of annual event. And so we started um, one of the nation's first annual fermentation festivals. Um, as a celebration of fermented food and drink, a way to get people to try new things and think about fermenting at home. The first year it was free, um, and we had a line around the block, and we realized, oh, goodness, this is really, people are excited to have this festival. So ever since then, it's been $10 to get in. Children 12 and under get in for free. Sandor came to that first festival, and he spoke at it, and he's been back a few times since then, and so did he, great ins- fun. did he inspire the festival or did he inspire you personally to start fermenting at home? Both. So when I moved, I moved to Portland in 2002 and um, I had been working, Cousteau's son has a marine camp on Catalina Island. So I was working with kids down there um, doing not scuba instruction, um, snorkel instruction there. And then I also managed the garden So when I moved to Portland, so teaching kids about, you know, vegetable gardening, composting, seed saving. When I moved to Portland, I got to have my first personal home garden. I'd worked on farms before, but this was the first time I got to have a a home garden. And it was so fruitful and bountiful. I had just did not know what to do with the amount of vegetables that I had because I'd gotten compost from whatever the fuel company is there on foster a big load of it and added that to the topsoil that was already rich. So I got a pickling recipe from my older Italian neighbor, like a quick pickle recipe. And then I went to Mirador community store, which has since closed, but a real great back to basics shop, uh, do it yourself shop on division and I got my first stoneware crock so you can ferment in jars um, but it's nice to have a big crock or several as I have now to ferment in and I got a copy of Sandor's book Wild Fermentation so that was my first my entree into fermentation was through Sandor's book Wild Fermentation and then I got to go out to Tennessee to interview him and then we got to start this great annual festival that he he loves as well and comes to so kind of dreamy how everything 
You just sort of Isn't it find fun? something you love and then keep doing it. And Isn't it fun how the universe works and doors open? I love it. Yeah. Okay, so you said something interesting. I I'm, I think I know what it is, but not everybody might. What's Skillshare mean? You said Sandor does skill sharing about fermentation. So the thing about fermentation, it's similar. I liken it to gardening. Um, it's not necessarily all that complicated, although you can really geek out and get into the wonky science of things always. But basically, there you learn by doing. So you need you're going to be making some mistakes. Everything is not going to be perfectly clear if you're reading a recipe it's really nice to have someone who has made miso for years and years to kind of watch how they inoculate those soybeans watch how they make the koji um, see what it feel what what it that consistency feels like when you put it into the crock it's very tactile so skill sharing is a um, just kind of shorthand for um being able to learn from someone who's done something a lot of times um, and not have to rely on, you know, a YouTube video or, or looking something up on your tiny computer, a.k.a. cell phone. And I suspect that fer- fermenting food at home kind of has a little bit of mystery to it to people that don't know. Um, and it's uh, a friend of mine um, owns a Oregon Coast Wasabi. And a growing wasabi, there's a lot of mystery and, you know, very secretive culture, whereas uh, they're very, you know, they teach people how to grow wasabi at home and sell plant starts and kind of demystify it. Um, and it sounds like you guys do a similar thing with fermented foods. Yeah, it's uh, what the thing is, you can get as complicated as you want about it, but if you just want to start fermenting things at home, and Sandor has said this for years and years, all you really need is a jar, a knife, a cutting board, some sort of vegetable and some salt and you, you know, chop up that cabbage, chop up those carrots, chop up that kale, salt it, kind of squish it with your hand so that the salt starts to eke out the, the natural, the water inside of it and then smash it down into your jar so that the water rises and you just want to keep those that whatever vegetable you have submerged for anywhere from days to weeks so that it just starts to get sour and it ferments and you get that ac- the acidifying bacteria makes it yummy and tastes like like it's pickled because it is. Yeah, what do you what did yeah. you tell me? Rotting food is delicious. It is. <laughs> Contained, you know, it's like very you got to make sure that you encourage the the, the good rot. Yeah, exactly. I that makes out. sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm a if I'm a novice and clueless, yeah, and I just am, just want to check it out, I can come. I can walk around. I can sample stuff. Yeah. Go up to the roof, have a nice meal and a cider, and go home. If yep. I want to go a little bit more into it, I can ask questions and learn from things. If I'm all with the other respect, I'm a fermentation geek. I can talk to people who know you know 401 and kind of pick their brain at the same time. Yeah, and you can, you know, visit tables such as Gabe Rosen's from Biwa. He'll be there. Oh, I love Gabe. He's, he's fantastic. A, he's a, you know, uh, tried and true festival friend. He comes every year, and he's going to be serving up suke mono, so Japanese fermented vegetables this year. Um, so you can talk to him about what inspired that and which trip to Japan he first tried them. Um, or you can talk to Matt Choi and Chong Choi of Choi's Kimchi and kind of get their story and um, find out what's a, you know, a spicier um, kimchi that I can make that's like this but a little bit hotter. What chili would you suggest adding? Or you can go to Nat's table and, um, and try his okolehau and ask him what inspired you to make this. So what's the new, there's something that you haven't had before that'll be this year at the festival. Um, the okolehau I have never had. Um, the tofu um, miso zuke from Oban PDX. Um, that's Fumiko and Jason. They are going to have this, I think it's kind of soft and funky and flavorful tofu that they, they ferment. And I, I've never had it. it. I've seen it on menus. I've just, it, not, not often, but... Right. And yeah. then what was the, um, there was a Korean beverage. Um, oh, Makgoli. I think that that's how you pronounce it as well. Um, so that I'm excited about. I have never had it and I love Korean food, um, but it's a unfiltered, uh, I think primarily rice and sometimes wheat um, fermented alcoholic beverage. So think like if you wanted to compare it to something, think sake. 
uh, unfiltered sake. So, um, and I'm not sure who, that's an amateur maker, so not in business, um, but someone awesome will be there pouring mock goalie, and you can try that. That sounds like so much fun. I Particularly know. someone just has a passion for making it home and bringing it to share. That's what, so in years, in the very beginning, it was almost all amateur makers. So people who just like myself were making the hard cider at home or sour pickles in their basement or whatever it was you brought to the festival and shared it with everyone. And then as this sort of um, new, res- like a resurgence of excitement over fermented foods on the marketplace has happened, a lot of those businesses such as Nat's um, have become, uh, I mean, a lot of those folks such as Nat have become tried and true businesses now. So this year we really tried to rein back the businesses and kind of encourage homemakers because that's what the festival spirit is, is we want um, it to be less about spending money and consumption and more about trying things by home doers and makers and, um, and yeah. It sounds awesome. Okay. It is. It's so fun. speaking of um, fermenting at home, tell me some of the foods that you personally ferment at home. Okay, awesome. I do a lot of food and drink fermentation. So the newest ferment that I have is soy sauce. Um, So I went to Japan in January and spoke at their fermentation future forum. Um, And I tried a lot of amazing soy sauces. And I'd never, it was sort of that aha moment where I've just had quite simple run-of-the-mill soy sauces, um, like Kikoman and... um, all of these, you know, grab, grab a bottle for $3 soy sauces, but I had some really delicious ones there. So I've been making that and, uh, it's six months old at this point. Um, I just need to figure out like typically if you're fermenting soy sauce, you're going to wait until at least six months to try it. And then you can go for years. So I have to figure out if I want to start sampling it now. I, I dip my finger in, but I, it's really like the slurry and you need to press the solids and get the, 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 um, the soy sauce out. I also make miso, a lot of different misos, fruit wines, vinegars, sour pickles, kimchi all the time. If I run out of kimchi, I'm, I'm a cranky bird. So it's like if you run out of coffee, it's just not a good situation. <laughs> Those are the main things. And then, you know, little uh, unusual other ferments here and there. Do you sauerkraut? I do. I love sauerkraut. I brought you the Coca-Cola vinegar, too. That's another fun thing. So what the heck is Coca-Cola vinegar? I see this bottle. I'm going to take it home. What yeah. is Coca-Cola vinegar? Well, basically, vinegar, uh, you can acidify a starchy liquid, a uh, sweetened liquid, or an alcohol. So you could, m- you could make into vinegar juices, um, like rice slurries, uh, or, you know, any kind of wine or beer or cider. Um, so that, I just took the, the sweetened beverage route. And so I, my friends had a tiki wedding this summer, and they had a lot of um, bottles of Coca-Cola and ginger beer that were left after at the end of the night. My boyfriend was DJing, so I was helping to kind of clean up. They said, oh, take some bottles of Coca-Cola and some ginger beer. So I thought, oh, they love vinegar, this couple. And um, Julia makes shrubs, so I thought, oh, I'll make her and and Joey some Coca-Cola vinegar. So I just poured it into the vinegar mother, sort of like cellulose with bacteria and um, looks kind of like a kombucha, kombucha mother, that kind of weird, cloudy, ghost-like substance at the bottom. And then you just sort of let it um, sit with cheesecloth over it and kind of aerate and ferment for a few weeks. I think that's been, yeah, two weeks been fermenting and it tastes really good so what am i gonna what do i do with this i'm really excited well you just sample it whenever you want to sample it um see what what you think of the flavor i think it's if you had to compare it to something that's more that you've had before it would be like a balsamic so it's a real rich kind of deeper dark flavor um i think any kind of dressing so you'd want to have something that would kind of stand up to the flavor of it, um, so maybe like a chicory salad or arugula salad or radicchio, something that some kind of green that has a little bite to it. But um, yeah, you could braise with it. I only gave you a little bit. I'll give you more the next time. But I think probably with that amount, I would make just a little dressing. Okay. You can make dressing with the miso. You okay, can make so a Coca-Cola miso vinaigrette. Okay, speaking of the miso, you uh, gave me a, this really cool jar of miso. Yeah. And I'm going to... Now, for those... So what is miso? It's fermented what? So... The, the most common kind is fermented 
soybeans with koji. So koji can be any grain that's inoculated with these mold spores that ferment it. So that could be rice is what I used in this situation. So it's soybeans, rice that's been inoculated with the mold, sea salt, and then you um, the soybeans are cooked and you kind of mash them up to the consistency that you want, put them in the crock, put salt over the top and let it ferment. So that's what it is. And I like when I make it at home to keep it a little bit chunkier um, because usually when you're getting miso at the store, it's a paste. And I like to kind of have the bite of the beans in it. And you can make it out of all different legumes, black beans, red beans, lima beans, chickpeas. And this particular miso was made with? That one is with soybeans and uh, rice koji and sea salt. And it's two years old. Two years old. Wow. Yeah. And um, what's the oldest miso that you've made? The oldest one that I have, I started a batch in 2010. So it's almost inky. It, it, it looks like it's black when you have a large volume of it. But when you, it's a really, really dark brown and it's so salty. It's too salty. So I've, I've learned since to, to, when I scrape off the mold and the salt off the top of the crock, to put a little bit less salt and to put a barrier over it. Um, anyway, it's delicious. It just, it just gets, you know, denser and, um, more umami and kind of rounds out the sourness. Okay, for those who don't know, what is umami? So there's sour, there's sweet, um, there's bitter. What's umami? Umami is that, um, delicious savory sense in food that things such as, um, like braised meats and miso and soy. It's that... If you make a mushroom, a really strong a mushroom. A really strong mushroom. Um, if you make a mushroom sauce. You know, I just cook down mushrooms with butter and all yeah. that gosh. So it's that that thing. Yeah. This is this is umami exactly. Yeah. Uh, this miso is incredible. Yeah, I'm it's, glad you like it. It is salty. It's yeah. not too salty. It's salty. It's rich. Yeah. It's deep. Um, it's incredible. So I'm going to, I'm making dinner someone tomorrow night Yay. and somehow I'm going to incorporate this miso. What the heck should I do with it? I'm so excited. I think, um, what I, my favorite thing to do with it is to make a big salad and use some kind of citrus lemons or limes or a really good vinegar and some oil and maybe a tiny bit of hot sauce or some chilies and then toss up a salad with it. You can go the traditional route and just make some really yummy miso soup and, um, you could, make a miso butter and kind of brown up some vegetables in the pan. Some Brussels sprouts are really good. Have them and kind of saute them and um, add the miso butter to glaze them towards so how the do end. So how do I make miso butter? Just take this and mix it with softened butter? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This and yeah. butter and then glaze some vegetables yeah. in it? And then Holy put a little, hell. like right when you're done, a little squeeze of lemon or lime over the top just to kind of cut through a little all bit that of brightness. richness. Yeah. Okay, I'm taking mm. notes. I'm so excited. I think that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to do a miso butter glazed vegetables finish with a little bit of lime. What time's dinner? <laughs> <laughs> What's your address? Where are I, you? <laughs> this is... Man, thank you so much. This miso is oh, incredible. Yeah. I'd you know, love to share it. And if this is any example of the kind of cool stuff I'm going to taste uh, when I go to the Portland Fermentation Festival, I am so excited to go. <laughs> it's going to be super fun. And I it also, I think that I mentioned demos, but that's a fun aspect too. Like out on the mezzanine at EcoTrust, um, you can go out there and learn from folks how to step by step how to make these delicious foods. So usually Claudia Lucero is out there and Heidi Nestler always does. Uh, they both do demos. Um, Claudia is doing fermented nut cheeses this year, I believe. And Heidi usually, she has one Paku Natto. Um, so she'll do a Natto demo. That sort of, I was talking about that, um, fra that, Rice crispy treat like consistency thing. Hers is really good. I don't usually love natto, but hers is good. I like it. Yeah, it kind of gets this um, funky, almost ammonia y thing sometimes when I've had it made by other people. And hers is really light and um, doesn't have that aspect to it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Liz, thank you much for uh, joining us on the Portland Culinary Podcast, talking about the Portland Fermentation Fest Festival. Very excited to attend, and uh, um, thank you so much for bringing all the culinary joy to Portland that you do. Thank you so much. And can I say one more thing? Yes. Um, if you want to get tickets, fermentationfestival.com. Okay. I didn't, every I don't year. I think I ever mentioned that. Every yeah. year. Yeah. And I'll yeah. put the link in everything. Awesome. All right. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Thanks.